Some would say that those struggles are all over, that all the horizons have been explored, that all the battles have been won, that there is no longer an American frontier. For the problems are not all solved, and the battles are not all won. And we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s, the frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, the frontier of unfilled hopes and unfilled threats. But the new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises. It is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer to the American people, but what I intend to ask of them. It's 1960, and it's time for the American voters to choose a new leader for the next decade. The presidential election of 1960 featured two incredibly strong candidates, Democrat John F. Kennedy versus Republican Richard M. Nixon. Kennedy was a United States Senator from the state of Massachusetts. He was the son of a wealthy Irish Catholic family who had always been involved in politics. He was incredibly charismatic and an inspiring speaker, but his opponents saw him as too young, too inexperienced, and he was Catholic. No Catholic had ever been elected president before and many Americans feared that a Catholic candidate would be heavily influenced by the Pope in the Vatican. This would be an issue that Kennedy would have to battle the entire election. Nixon was the current Vice President of the United States under President Eisenhower. He was the son of a poor Quaker family from California. He had solid foreign policy experience, and he also had success hunting down communists as a senator during the McCarthy era. But Nixon didn't appeal to voters the way that Kennedy did. He wasn't as charismatic, he wasn't as charming, or as good looking as Kennedy but he hoped to ride the popularity of President Eisenhower all the way to the White House. John F. Kennedy defeats Nixon by 119,000 votes. That's less than 0.1% of the United States population. Two factors led to JFK's election. One was the televised debates. 70 million voters watched JFK versus Nixon debate on issues on TV. This was the first time in history that a debate was held on TV. During the debate, Kennedy looked better, spoke better, and appeared more presidential. The kind of country we have here, the kind of society we have, the kind of strength we build in the United States will be the defense of freedom. The things that Senator Kennedy has said, many of us can agree with. Another factor leading to Kennedy's election is the African-American vote. When Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested in October of 1960, JFK called his wife to console her. Nixon did nothing, so African-American voters saw JFK as more of an ally. On January 20th, 1961, John Fitzgerald Kennedy is inaugurated as the 35th President of the United States. His inaugural address is one of the most iconic speeches in all of American history. He announces to the world that the American government and American society is now driven by a younger generation who has fought World War II and is ready to preserve liberty at any cost. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. It is a call to service in which he asks the American people to give back to their country instead of expecting something from it. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The speech sets the tone for the Kennedy administration. John F. Kennedy's administration is often referred to as Camelot. This referred to the mythical but glamorous court of King Arthur, which was ruled by lords and ladies and the knights of the round table. In books, Camelot was a wonderful place because the future was always optimistic and anything seemed possible under the leadership of King Arthur. Like King Arthur, John F. Kennedy was young, handsome, charismatic, and a great leader. At his side was JFK's wife, Jacqueline Kennedy. 
Jackie became the biggest fashion icon in United States history. Raised in an aristocratic East Coast family, Jackie was bred for high class. Women across the country idolized her for her fashion, glamour, etiquette, taste, and education. John, Jackie, and their two young children, Caroline and John Jr., were the image of a perfect family. And it seemed like every day new pictures came out of the White House of President Kennedy being a devoted father. All of these factors led to the creation of the Kennedy Mystique, or this ideal image of the Kennedys as the perfect American family. The Kennedy Mystique made President Kennedy and his wife Jackie very popular, both at home and around the world. Part of the Kennedy Mystique of Camelot was his team of advisors. They were known as the best and the brightest. They were young, talented, fresh-faced, and forward-thinking. He added Harvard professors, business executives, and charity heads. Two of his most famous cabinet members were Defense Secretary Robert McNamara and Attorney General, his brother, Robert Kennedy. JFK's team of young intellectuals motivated young Americans to get involved in society and politics. Once in office, Kennedy begins his push for progress. His plan was called the New Frontier. Kennedy's first focus was fixing the economy. By 1960, the U.S. was in a recession and unemployment was at 6%. Kennedy employed two measures to help fix this. First, he enacted deficit spending. JFK cut taxes to allow Americans to have more income to spend. He also increased defense spending by 20%. Kennedy focuses his spending more on conventional weapons like submarines, missiles, and aircraft carriers, and moved away from spending on nuclear weapons. His second focus was on creating jobs and poverty relief. Kennedy increased the minimum wage to $1.25 an hour to boost consumerism. He also increased unemployment benefits and sent aid to poor cities. Internationally, the Kennedy administration sent economic and educational aid to poor countries in order to fight the influence of communism. In Kennedy's eyes, the communists didn't have to be fought with bullets, bombs, and guns, but instead could be fought by showing poor countries the popular appeal of capitalism and democracy. To help in this endeavor, President Kennedy created the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps sent over 30,000 college-age volunteers to poor nations around the world in order to help their populations. Most Peace Corps volunteers became teachers, health aides, nurses, engineers, and helped develop third world countries. Because poorer nations with more desperate people were more susceptible to falling to communism, President Kennedy felt by developing third world countries with American aid, it could help prevent these poor countries from turning to communism and keeping more allies on America's side. President Kennedy also approved the Alliance for Progress, focused particularly on the Western Hemisphere, the Alliance for Progress sent over $12 billion to Latin American countries in order to help build their infrastructure so they could be better trade partners with the United States, but also deter these countries from turning to communism as their political system. In 1962, Kennedy boldly states the United States will be the Soviets to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. JFK immediately boosts funding and education. His ambitious space challenge sees increased funding in scholarships and university research. Math and science programs take off. Funding also leads to the creation of NASA and the space race. JFK boosts funding to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Within months, an American, Alan Shepard, is in space. And a program to put a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth is on. The 1960s were off to a booming start. With a charismatic leader in charge, Americans felt inspired. The economy was turning around, American prestige around the world was growing, and the United States had their sights set on beating the Soviets to the moon. With America re-energized, President Kennedy was ready to lead the United States to great things in the 1960s. But I believe that the times require imagination and courage and perseverance. I'm asking each of you to be pioneers towards that new frontier. <laughs> 